In this episode, I'm speaking with Mark Fisher, who is the senior editor from the Washington Post. Mark wrote a fascinating article called, Is the Pandemic Over? Pre-COVID activities Americans are and are not resuming. Biden says that the pandemic is over, and when it comes to casinos, concerts, and cosmetic surgeries, Americans seem to agree. For theater therapy and funerals, though, not so much. I think you'll find our discussion on how divided we are in so many ways quite fascinating. Cue the music. Welcome to the Repurpose Your Career podcast, brought to you by Career Pivot. This podcast is where those of us in the second half of life come together to discuss how to repurpose our careers for the 21st century. Come listen to career experts give you proven strategies. Listen to people like you tell their stories on how they repurpose their careers. And finally, get your questions answered. Your host, Mark Miller, has made six career pivots over the last 30 years. He understands this is not about jumping out of the frying pan into a fire, but rather to create a plan where you make clear, actionable steps or pivots to a better future career. Are you ready to repurpose your career? Welcome to episode 296 of the Repurpose Your Career podcast. My name is Mark Miller, and I'll be your host every Monday for discussion on what it's like to repurpose your career. In this episode, I am speaking with Mark Fisher, who is the senior editor from the Washington Post. Mark wrote a fascinating article called, Is the Pandemic Over? Pre-COVID Activities Americans Are and Are Not Resuming. Biden says the pandemic is over. When it comes to casinos, concerts, and cosmetic surgery procedures, Americans seem to agree. For theater therapy and funerals, though, not so much. I will place a link to the article in the show notes. I think you will find our discussion about how divided we are in so many ways quite fascinating. We are making individual decisions based on our risk risk tolerance. I like Mark's analogy of a triage nurse making decisions on who gets treated next. As we decide whether to travel on a plane, go to a wedding, go into the office, or go to the movies— We are making individual decisions on how much risk we're willing to take. When one person may look at going to the movie as safe, others may look at it as extremely risky. This is a fascinating topic and discussion. Let me read you a bit of Mark's bio from the Washington Post's website. Mark Fisher, senior editor of the Washington Post, reports rights on a wide range of topics. He has been an enterprise editor, local columnist, and Berlin bureau chief, among other positions, over 30 years at the paper. Fisher wrote several Post articles that won the Pulitzer Prize for National Reporting in 2016 and the Pulitzer Prize for Public Service in 2014. Fisher previously wrote the Post's local column and blog, Raw Fisher. Earlier, he was the paper's special reports editor, wrote about politics, culture for the style section, served as Central Europe bureau chief on the Post's foreign staff, and covered D.C. schools and D.C. politics for the metro section. He was also an assistant city editor. However, before we get to the episode, let's have a word from our sponsor, Career Pivot. The Career Pivot membership community is a group of people from all over the U.S. and Canada with diverse backgrounds. This is a community where everyone is there to help everyone else out, figure out what they want to do in the second half of life, and then make it happen. Many have made changes that they did not know existed or was possible when they came to the community. They learned from each other and broadened their horizons on what was really possible. Let's hear what Cleo had to say about being part of the community. I got a lot of support, the, just the knowledge that you're not alone. Other people are struggling with the exact same thing and there are ways to deal with it. There are people, you know, there are people, some really interesting success stories that, you know, maybe that's not exactly what I can or want to do, but it's, and you can see the benefits that thing, people get from different things like that. A couple people that took that positive intelligence course, I could see a real difference in how they acted, felt, and their success after they completed it. And I didn't end up taking the course, but I got the book. I put it as an audio book on my phone. So I would listen to it while I was at the gym. And I mean, it helped me too, just trolling anxiety, getting back to reality, keeping your mind in a good place. 
and then there are people that I can reach out to. Like if I had something going on, I just felt like I needed to talk to somebody. There were people I could talk that were happy to talk to me. So it's been a positive thing. I am recruiting new members. If you are interested in learning more about the endeavor, please go to careerpivot.com slash community. Now on to my discussion with Mark Fisher. Welcome to the Repurpose Your Career podcast. I have the real joy of having Mark Fisher, who's senior editor from the Washington Post. And I wanted him on the podcast because he wrote a fascinating article. Is the pandemic over? Pre-COVID activities Americans are and are not resuming. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Glad to be here. What got you to write this article? We live in weird times. We certainly do, and it's exactly that weirdness that got me going on this. Uh, It was my own failure to comprehend why some things are open and others are closed, why some people are going back to old behaviors and others are not, why even within the same sector, within the same industry, you see such enormous differences in what people are doing and, and just how righteous they are about doing it. I had done some stories earlier on about uh, differences in the entertainment industry, uh, where you have theaters continuing to have tight restrictions about masks and distancing and crowd size. And you have concert halls, essentially the same business, going the opposite way, saying everybody come, crowd together, no masks necessary. And in, in one industry after another, that's true. So we see it in every business as they uh, decide how and whether to to pull people back into the office. The absolute righteousness of those who say, I'm never coming back to the office versus the absolute righteousness of those who are saying everybody's got to come back to the office. And so that is uh, really repeated in industry after industry, uh, in every aspect of our lives. Uh, and, and every one of us has to make decisions, whether no matter how strongly we believe that we should be back to normal or that nothing is safe yet. It doesn't matter what your personal position is. You still have to make decisions every day about, do I do this? Do I do that? Do I get on the plane? Do I sit next to the coughing guy? Do I uh, go to the family reunion? Do I go to the wedding? Uh, How many people will be there? Will it be indoors or out? Will people be masked or not? Just an endless calculus that has to go on in every one of our minds and hearts. Yeah, it's interesting. I was just back in Austin. The interesting one was I've got a good, I've got a former client who's my age, he's about 66. He's had major health issues and he's not too terribly worried about stuff, but his wife is, and she is more concerned than he is. And he's cautious. He's not stupid, but it's how we react to the stuff is all different. Right. And one person's cautious is another person's stupid. Uh, so we, we don't even agree on what counts as cautious. And uh, so as consumers, sometimes we have a choice and sometimes we don't. And when we don't have a choice, that can make us angry or secure and confident. And then other times in our daily lives, we, we have lots of choices and we're frustrated by how many choices we have. I talked to some folks who run the family reunions. Uh, that That's a particularly emotional, particularly subjective kind of decision that people have to make. Do I go spend time with relatives I haven't seen for years, who I really dearly want to see? And do I do it if it's going to be indoors or out? Do I do it if it's going to be uh, in, in some a uh, place where the virus is very active versus one that's not. And so that whole industry of family reunions, if you call it an industry, has seen these this roller coaster of mass cancellations in 2020. And then uh, everybody did it by Zoom the following year. And now there's been a surge back to pre-pandemic levels. And, and yet attendance is way down in some places and way up in others. Uh, So, you know, we see this in our voting lives where people are going off toward greater extremes in both directions. And we're seeing it in in those 
personal behavior decisions that we're making too, where people are either taking a strong stand one way or the other, or are kind of wobbling in the middle and, and just don't know what the right thing to do might be. So what does age play into this? Particularly, I was interested in the reunions and in the theater stuff. When I went back to Austin to get vaccinated in 2020, it, I had 28 days, I had 26 coffee meetings. And I had, this is, I guess, 2021. And I had half, almost a dozen people who had not been out of their homes and met with anybody outside their house in a year. And these are all older people. Right. I think there is a significant generation gap that's developed as people look toward how they're going to behave in the coming months and years. And uh, but it's not it's not black and white. It's not uh, it's not an easy cleavage between old and young. Uh, So in general, uh, industries that cater to or depend on older folks are being more cautious. So you're seeing uh, Theaters, for example, are saying either you have to wear a mask or Broadway theaters in New York are saying, "Okay, we'll have one or two nights a week where it's mask required so that uh, that audience, which tends to be older, uh, that's more comfortable that way, uh, can can have that level of comfort. But it doesn't. It's not all old people and it's not all young people. A lot of the most cautious people are the very young, uh, particularly those of childbearing age or people with young kids. Uh, They are every bit as cautious as a lot of the oldest people who are the most vulnerable to the virus. So it's not an easy question just of age, but, uh, and in fact, uh, I talked to a number of people who run some of the larger family reunions in the country, and they said that it was the oldest folks who most desperately wanted to be there. And so in some cases, they just said, damn it, I'm going. And, and uh, they took the risk because it's what, what's, what I think we're seeing more than hard and fast rules is that people are running their own triage system. So they're, they're, they're making their own decisions, just like the person in the hospital at the front desk who's deciding who gets treated next. They're deciding this is a risk I'm going to take. I need to see my cousins again uh, before they get too old. I'm going to the reunion. So some reunions, it's the oldest and the youngest who most want to be there, and they go. In other reunions, those are exactly the two groups that are missing because they're most worried about their health or most worried about their children. So it's, uh, you know, I wish I could say that after I spent a few weeks delving into this, I came up with hard and fast rules. I didn't, and I don't think any of us have. And that's why this virus continues to be as politically and socially divisive as it is. You talk about, you know, that we're, we're back on the planes again. In Austin, I was there during the Formula One race, which broke all records for passenger traffic through the airport. Fortunately, I was not flying out of Austin. But then again, you say people aren't too keen about getting back on buses and subways and public transit. It's it's very strange. I mean, it, again, it's this triage thing where people say, well, I need to get on the plane because I need to go see my parents or whatever the reason is to go to this family event uh, or this business meeting. And so they'll get on the plane, but it, which is every bit as packed tight as the trains and buses, and yet the trains and buses have not had uh, the return of uh, of passengers uh, to the same extent. And I think part of that is just the perception we have that it's somehow safer on a plane. Uh, they've done a very good job in the airline industry of persuading us that they really do exchange the air quite frequently. I don't know the science of it. I don't know how true it is, but we seem to be as collectively taking their word for it. Whereas I think people think of buses and think, well, whatever the cheapest thing is, that's what they're probably doing. And so that doesn't feel as safe, but it's just, again, it's done by feel. Um, and I think, uh, you know, for those who do fly a lot now, and I'm increasingly flying more, it's not the plane that's frightening. It's the airport terminal. It's those crowded terminals when you're, queuing up to get on the plane, Uh, you know, especially if you're flying Southwest and you're in those tightly packed queues right at the gate, it really is uh, this, this feeling of I'm too close to other people. And that's, that's just a change in our psyches that's happened as a result of these last several years. Uh, It's not clear 
how much more dangerous that is at this point. And it obviously depends on who's in the line and whether they really have tested and whether they really have vaccinated and so on. But um, everyone is, is doing this calculation internally. And that may be why we're seeing so many more confrontations and arguments in all of those public settings uh, than we did pre-pandemic. I want to go back to the whole travel and this whole concept of revenge travel. It's it's interesting. Uh, I just had, had an article here at Puerto Vallarta. Puerto Vallarta had one of the biggest summer travel in their history. And like most of the Mexican beaches, they're hotter than hell in the summer. People don't go there. <laughs> they go there in the winter. Yet people were just traveling for the sake of traveling. Yeah, I think there's there's tremendous pent up demand. Uh, everybody in the travel industry is seeing it. It's this sense of I've been deprived for these several years of uh, all the things that I've you know saved up to do or always wanted to do or want to cross off my list. Uh, and people are deprived of that uh, of those experiences and and uh, of being with the people they travel with and all of that. So uh, so there's tremendous pent up demand, which means that travel. Uh, leisure travel is is way more expensive as a result because demand is is through the roof, and uh, so we're seeing that in in terms of hotels, airfares, uh, rent the rental car industry exacerbated by the shortage of rental cars uh, because the rental car companies, in their wisdom, sold off large chunks of their fleets during the pandemic which you know, in retrospect seems awfully short-sighted, uh, but now they're reaping the profits of being able to jack up their rates because they have that uh, perhaps artificial shortage that's occurred. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, travel is way up and, and I, evidently people are okay with the crowded airports and the crowds once they get somewhere because they're continuing to do it. So it's not, it doesn't seem to be deterring folks from traveling. And, uh, you know, the, the days of, of empty airports are over. Although, you know, here on the East Coast, uh, where uh, train travel is uh, maybe not quite as popular as, as plane travel, it's, it's an important factor, an important part of the industry, and the, the trains are not full. They're, they're, they're doing okay, and they're, they're definitely coming back, uh, but they're by no means as full as, as the planes are. So that earlier difference that we talked about uh, in, in perceptions, those, those differences are still out there. And there's no question the events planners I spoke to made it very clear that uh, they are just inundated with business, and you know, they're putting people off for years. They're booking multiple events on the same day, whether it be weddings, uh, family gatherings, business meetings and so on. People want to be together in the same place. Now you have one sentence in here that really jumped out at me. It says almost two thirds of Americans now believe there's little or no risk in returning to their pre-pandemic lives. And 46% of them say they've already done so. The highest level yet recorded in a coronavirus index survey conducted in mid-September. That still says a third of people believe there's still risk. And 54% of people have not returned to what they've done before. Those are big numbers. They're big numbers. And um, this is another one of those cases where both sides are right. The people who are afraid and don't want to or can't bring themselves to go back to their normal lives, they're absolutely right. And you can pick up any uh, news publication, look on any news site and see those daily tallies of coronavirus cases, hospitalizations, and deaths, the hospitalizations and deaths are way down from where they had been. That's because of the vaccine. We aren't as doing nearly as well as some other countries in vaccination uptake, but, but we're doing okay, in, in, at least compared to some others. And it's had a tremendous impact on reducing those hospitalizations and deaths. But the case numbers are still way up there. And, uh, and and we're still talking about 350 to 400 deaths a day. Uh, and that's not nothing. And so those people who see those numbers or hear those stories from people uh, they know or have had the experience with the virus themselves that they don't want to repeat, those folks are making one set of decisions. And as you said, that's a very substantial part of the population. But the larger part of the population is saying that uh, it's not a big deal. They had it. It wasn't so bad. Uh, 
a relative had it that wasn't so bad, uh, and it's a it's a price they're willing to pay uh, to get back to something like normal. So we're we're as divided over that as we are over everything else, and it's a natural division because there is this range of human attitudes toward risk. And we see it in how people invest their money. We see it in how people spend their time. And so, of course, we see it in how people decide uh, whether and how to return to, to something that feels like uh, pre-2020 normal. And uh, so I don't think that's going to go away overnight. I do think those differences will diminish. And it's clear already, as you look over the last year and a half, that that is a process that is diminishing. These numbers are moving in the direction of people going back to normal. So, uh, you know, for all those folks who want uh, everybody back in the office, for all those folks who want real menus at the restaurant again, and not a QR code, for all of those things that are either annoying or seemingly unnecessary about COVID protections, we're moving in that direction collectively. There will always be people who say, I'm not going with you. I'm going to keep wearing my mask. I'm going to keep avoiding crowds. Uh, but there will, over time, be fewer and fewer of those people, uh, which makes life harder on them and uh, makes those in the majority feel more comfortable. Uh, that's It's just a process that, uh, you know, you look back at the history of pandemics, they all end like that. They all move in this direction slowly and then quickly. It's just human nature. Some people adapt and accept risk in different ways from others, period. Yeah, I want to move on. The fact that we're going to outdoor concerts and indoor arenas like crazy, but we're not going back to the movies and we're not going to Broadway. We're not uh, We're not going to the symphony. Yeah. Uh, so some of that is the age factor that you mentioned earlier. Uh, the symphony draws a large, a, a largely older crowd, so they've been more cautious than most uh, big venues in uh, asking people to continue to wear masks. Although the big concert halls, the Kennedy Center here in Washington, uh, some of the bigger concert halls in New York, have dropped the mask mandate in recent weeks. Uh, so it's all moving in that direction, but again, slowly. I think what you're seeing uh, is so it's partly a factor of age. It's partly uh, just a question of um, the political social outlook of certain parts of the country. So it, it really does seem to vary by metropolitan area. And so a place like New York felt like it was moving back toward normal a lot sooner than a place like Washington, which is socially more conservative, maybe not as accustomed uh, to big crowds and lots of people gathering uh, on a frequent basis uh, indoors, all packed together. Different places have different cultures, and we're seeing that reflected in the, the pace and pattern of returning to normal. You know, it, it varies from art form to art form, and that's a curious thing. I think the propensity of people to return to in-person events. They're more willing to do that if the entertainment is a live entertainment. So theaters are, are, are doing a little bit better perhaps than, than movie theaters because also habits changed over the course of the pandemic. A lot of the programming that we go to the movie theater for is now available at home on our smaller but nonetheless decent sized screens. And so people's habits changed. And so it, it, the, the Hollywood and the movie industry are caught up in a tremendous uh, self-examination and uh, rejiggering of the way they calculate where and how people will view what they watch, what, what they produce. And so they are making things now that they assume will be shows that will be uh, direct to streaming and others that they think have real potential to bring people back to the theaters. Uh, does that mean that we're going to be stuck with only blockbuster uh, tentpole movies in the theaters? Unfortunately, there may be more of that and those kind of uh, mid-range mid-market, good old storytelling kinds of movies that are maybe higher end, higher shelf, uh, those uh, are, are less likely to appear in movie theaters than they used to be. Uh, will that change uh, anybody's guess? I mean, the experience of going to the theater now strikes some people as really annoying because there are other people there and they make noise and they 
bother you when they get up to, to uh, go get some pop, more popcorn. On the other hand, it uh, it's an experience that many people, other people crave and really want the giant screen and the sensor around sound and all of that. So uh, that that's an industry that is really in flux. Yeah. The one thing that, that I came away from with this, from this was um, if I go to a live music event, a lot of it's being around other people who are also just as much into the, into the music. Yeah. Going to a movie is a very solitary event. Right. Uh, unless it's the kind of uh, event that the kind of movie that people have a visceral loud reaction to a horror film. Nobody wants to watch a horror film by themselves. The part of the fun of doing a horror film is, is the, the gasps and shouts of people around you. Uh, same thing with a comedy. Comedies play much better in a theater because other people are laughing, which encourages you to laugh. You're having a better time than you are sitting at home on the couch by yourself. So it, it, it really does have to do with the kind of content that we're talking about. Uh, but in general, I think uh, what, what live theater is depending on is that uh, that's something you can only do with a crowd. It is enhanced by the crowd, uh, whether it's a tragedy or comedy, that you, the sense that you're all experiencing this together, that there's a community, even if it's people who don't know each other, uh, that, that that's part of the value that you're buying. And that is very different from binge watching uh, the latest show on, on HBO or, or Netflix at home uh, where you, you are not dependent on others' reactions. You're just kind of taking the time by yourself. So that leads me to why has everyone gone back to Vegas? And I think uh, what the Vegas tourism folks would tell us is that uh, they're not really coming back just for the gambling. In fact, Vegas has not been just about the gambling for quite some time. Uh, so two things are happening in Vegas. Number one, the business meetings are coming back. So the conventions, which are really the lifeblood of that uh, tourist city. And then the other thing is the shows. So people are going for the shows. They're going for that communal experience. They're going uh, because those shows are a whole lot more exciting and fulfilling when you're there in person with a big crowd that's paid a lot of money for those tickets uh, and that wants to have that experience together and get something out of it, get something out of being in that room, everybody laughing together, everybody crying together. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the business meetings, the conventions, that is something that's coming back slowly. There's still a lot of caution around that. Um, the organizer, and I spoke to a number of convention organizers who said they are having to rethink how they run conventions. So they're leaving a lot more time for individual meetings, for people to go on walks together, uh, for people to have small settings, um, a lot less time being spent, everybody together in one giant room. So that's going to change the convention industry, which has always, uh, in the last 20, 30 years, it has been all about who can build the bigger building, who can build the bigger room for, for that one giant gathering of, of all the cardiologists and all the salesmen uh, of, of uh, metallurgy or whatever it is. Uh, each of those conventions fought for decades to be bigger and bigger and bigger. Now they're suddenly coming up with strategies to be smaller, uh, to be more to be smarter about w having a variety of ways that people to get, can get together so that they feel comfortable and they want to be there. They want to make those connections. They want to meet those people. They, they understand what these three years have done to us in terms of separating us, not making new connections nearly as much as we had been. Uh, so they want that experience, but they want it with some confidence that they're not walking into a super spreader event every time they enter a convention room. Yeah, I've got a bunch of friends who are all they're all in the meeting industry. And of course mm -hmm. their business was just blown up. I know a number of them are have actually taken jobs because it, the whole meeting industry is coming back slower than than they would like. Yeah. I'd like to finish up with um doctor visits. We, a lot of things went virtual during the pandemic. One of my concerns is will we continue to well, insurance companies continue to pay for virtual visits. It's it's a really interesting question. And I even when I started reporting this story, 
I didn't even know that that was uh, as as hard fought a question as it is, but it is. And so it really varies uh, from state to state. Uh, but what we're seeing in general is that on the medical front, uh, people are returning to the office. They want to see their doctors in person. Uh, the doctors, for the most part, want to see them in person. And um, although there are some things for which uh, virtual check, not so much checkups, but virtual visits uh, will continue and telemedicine, I think, will have a larger role to play. That is going to depend not just on what doctors and patients want to do, but what on, what insurers want to do and what uh, regulators want to do. And those uh, insurers and regulators uh, are a little skeptical of the idea that they should have to shell out as much for a telehealth visit as they do for an in-person visit. And I think I think most people would agree that it's just not the same thing. Uh, and so maybe it should be reimbursed at a lower rate. Doctors don't like that. They want uh, top dollar for their minutes. Uh, and, uh, and of course, patients uh, uh, don't want to pay the big money. So sometimes we prefer uh, the telehealth. Um, so it, it's uh, that is very much in flux. And I think uh, it's going to be driven by uh, as so much in that industry is by the decisions of insurers rather than by doctors and patients coming together to decide what's best for the patient. Um, the most fascinating thing to me about that line of reporting was that in the medical field, people are rushing back to the office, but not in the mental health field. Mental health counseling, that ha went heavily over to uh, telehealth to phone visits and Zoom visits uh, during the, the heart of the pandemic and has stayed that way. And, uh, you know, it's the old thing about uh, people lying on the couch facing away from the therapist, away from the counselor. There is a certain way in which we are more open when we're not making eye contact where, you know, it's like the kids... Uh, telling, talking to their parents from the back seat of the car, They're, they'll say things from the back seat of the car that they would never say face to face over the dinner, dining uh, table, and so that uh, lack of eye contact uh, seems to have struck a chord with both therapists and patients in the mental health field, and of course those therapists can see more people in the same amount of time when they do it virtually. Uh, and so as long, again, as long as the insurers are going to go along with it, I think that's what uh, mental health care is going to look like in this country for some time to come. Yeah, I've had several psychiatrists on this podcast. And one of the things they talk about is, yes, at the beginning of the pandemic, this mass rush to get online. And any number of them saw improved outcomes because people would show up at their appointments because they didn't require to actually walk into an office which could be kind of intimidating. Right. Right. But I can just get on my phone, see my therapist, talk to them, and it's um, much less invasive. So what in all of this surprised you the most? I think one thing that was fascinating was the degree to which people are ready and eager to go back to the big, meaningful events that, that, that mark stages of our lives, weddings, funerals. People want to be there uh, for themselves, for each other, for their families. Um, so that, that, that's pretty logical. But uh, on the other hand, there does seem to be a permanent change or at least semi-permanent change in the nature of funerals that surprised me. And that is uh, they're smaller. They are not necessarily right after the death. People are delaying them by weeks and months, and they're generally not at the cemetery because people moved over the course of the pandemic very heavily toward cremation, in part because it's cheaper, in part because you don't have to have a lot of people there. And so that is a big that's a shift that had been happening in American society for some time, but it really accelerated during the pandemic. And a lot of people in that industry think it's going to continue. And that changes the way we come together, the way we're able to share stories and, and, and comfort one another in that time. And I think that is, that's a part of American life that we don't like to talk about because obviously it's uncomfortable and all that, but it's a big part of life. And it's one to see such a, dramatic change so quickly uh, doesn't feel quite healthy to me, but um, 
uh, and it obviously hasn't settled into what form it's going to take long term, but but it's it's very much in flux and it, 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 in a surprising way. Well, let's finish on that note. Uh, talking about death, <laughs> <laughs> finality. Yes. So, Mark, if someone wanted to reach out and contact you, how might they do that? Uh, well, they can email me at fisherm uh, at washpost.com. That's F-I-S-H-E-R-M at washpost.com. Uh, or I'm on Twitter at uh, M-F Fisher. That's M-F and then another F-I-S-H-E-R. Well, Mark, and I have to have to say, your mother knew how to spell Mark. I I, I see that, and and I, uh, I I tip my hat to you and your mother. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you very much for being on the Repurpose Your Career podcast. It was it was a great conversation. Thanks very much. Hope you found our discussion useful. I want you to assess your own risk tolerance and how it's affecting your decisions. Take a moment, go to careerpivot.com, sign up for the weekly Career Pivot Insights newsletter, which is sent out every Sunday. You'll get a weekly update on this podcast, white papers, and new blog posts. I just published my latest white paper, Ageism, the Last Acceptable Bias. While there, do not forget to check out the Career Pivot community, which can be found at careerpivot.com slash community. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Look for Career Pivot on Facebook and LinkedIn. You'll also find me on Twitter at Career Pivot. Thank you for listening all the way to the end of the Repurpose Your Career podcast. You will find all the show notes at careerpivot.com slash episodes 296. You'll also subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Podbeam, Overcast, Spotify, Pandora, Amazon Music, and lots of other places where podcasts can be found. This podcast can be found on the Repurpose Your Career podcast channel on YouTube. Hope to see you next Monday for another episode of Repurpose Your Career podcast.